Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in our general proteomics series. Today we're joined again by Professor Leonard Martin, who is our guest chair for this webinar, and our speaker, Professor Jana Lettio, who will be speaking about connecting cancer genotype with molecular phenotype by proteogenomics. I just have a few of the usual housekeeping points to go over before handing over to Leonard, who will introduce today's speaker and chair the question and answer session at the end. As always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussion. So please join us there to ask questions, share any thoughts and discuss the work. And Slack helps us to um, prioritize all the questions that other would, others would like to hear the answers to. So use the thumbs up to let us know those questions that you'd really like to hear answered. Slack will also allow our speakers to answer any other questions or follow up with questions after the talks have finished. And for those needing a, an attendance certificate for this webinar, there'll be details available on how to get this after the last slide. So once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, and they've especially asked us to remind any students attending today's talk that the society is free to join for students and for everyone, and membership benefits include travel bursaries and conference discounts. The Young Proteomics Investigators Club, the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. And um, also thanks to our YouTube uh, channel subscribers. All talks today will be available to watch again online. And huge thank yous to our speaker and the guest chair for their time today. We're also pleased to announce that our next webinar will be on Friday the 18th of September at two o'clock British summer time, where we will revisit the COVID related talks and we'll be hearing from two speakers returning uh, Professor Ray Cruz-Isles and a new speaker, Dr. Akhilesh Pandey, on their work in this area. So I'm sure Leonard needs no introduction for those who joined his talk a few weeks ago, but he's professor at the Department of Bio Molecular Medicine at Ghent University in Belgium, where he heads up the Compomix group, developing a plethora of tools for proteomics data analysis, including peptide shaker, ironbot, and MS2PIP. So now I'll hand over to Leonard, who will introduce today's speaker. Over to you, Leonard. Thank you very much. So, and uh, it's really an honor for me to introduce Professor Jana Letio today, um, who will undoubtedly give us very interesting background on uh, the use of proteogenomics in cancer. So, Jana actually has a perfect background for this. Not only is he currently a professor in medical proteomics at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, but he's also a scientific director at the Science for Life Laboratory um, at, the, at the Swedish National Laboratories for Bioscience. And uh, since this year, he's also on the board of directors of the Karolinska Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, he had actually had a master's uh, degree in biochemistry from Helsinki University in Finland, and then followed that up with a PhD in engineering from the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. But then he left academia for a while and worked for a few years in biotech in both uh, the United States and Europe. And then he obtained postdoctoral experience again in Karolinska, where he's uh, still located today. And in the interim, before becoming the professor of medical proteomics, he also um, worked on uh, as a PI in the Department of Oncology and Pathology. So you see a nice uh, uh, collection of experiences there from um, biochemistry over to engineering to biotech industry and then even in the uh, in the medical faculties. So as a result, it's no surprise, I think, that um, one of the key goals in the research of uh, Professor Vetio is to improve uh, proteome analysis for precision cancer medicine. And the group really focuses on lung and breast cancer. Um, and they're now also looking into leukemias as well. Um, maybe a few other things is that uh, uh, Jan has uh, been very successful in, in obtaining a lot of funding, including a uh, big infrastructure uh, fellowship grant by the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research. But he also branched out into the, the non-academic sector, the commercial sector, as a co-founder of Phenomark Diagnostics uh, in Sweden. So without further ado, I think we're all uh, very, very excited to hear about uh, Professor Letio's proteogenomics work. So Jarne, uh, I will give the floor to you so you can begin your presentation. Uh, as a small aside, I uh, will be monitoring the Slack channel, so make sure you post those questions and uh, thumbs up for those you like, and then I can ask them at the end. Uh, Professor Letio kindly uh, already mentioned that he will be online on the Slack channel afterwards, so if your question isn't picked by me, that is not a major disaster because the expert will be in attendance after the talk. Jana, your turn. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind invitation and uh, very kind uh, introduction. 
I have to say that I I would be much rather um, uh, in London right now uh, giving this talk than uh, in my uh, cottage in uh, in rural Sweden. Uh, that's why the very rural setting here. But um, this is where I am due to the COVID, so I'll have to uh, cope with this um, and hope to see you in London uh, and welcome to Stockholm uh, as soon as so. Uh, this is all over. Right, so I'll take, uh, talk about the uh, um, cancer genomics and cancer proteogenomics uh, field. And um, I already uh, got a thorough introduction from uh, Leonard, so I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, skip over uh, these introductions, but this, has, this is the, the National Facility Science for Life Laboratory that Leonard mentioned, and which is part of also the Karolinska Institute, and my group that has been doing all the great work. So I'll talk about the proteogenomics, uh, and uh, since this is quite new field still, uh, uh, it's a bit um, unclear the use of the term and, uh, and how people are using it. So. Uh, so few sort of uh, introductions uh, here before I go into the actual data. So the whole protogenomics field actually started by, uh, by using the proteomics data, the peptide level data, to find uh, bacterial open reading frames uh, that are actually coding proteins. So using the proteomics to find the uh, protein coding genome and defining it, and that's something that we have been also uh, doing in the eukaryotic setting quite much. Uh, but recently the proteogenomics term has been uh, started to use uh, in a different way in sort of understanding the uh, impact of genomic changes into the proteome. And in uh, you can see in the literature also uh, transcriptomics uh, compared to the proteome. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, we don't only look at the uh, impact of the genome effects on the quantitative proteomics, but also to the functional proteomics. What is the uh, impact, the proteome-wide impact in proteome localization, PTM activation, stability, and so on. Uh, in my view, I think that uh, one of the key things in the proteogenomics is also to take use of the genome sequence data and actually convert that into the proteome databases and uh, start looking at the protein variants in the, in the proteomic setting. But in the literature, the term is uh, used quite widely nowadays. The particular uh, addition to the proteogenomics field is, uh, is looking at the genome aberration in cancer and how they can cause cancer-specific proteins, uh, so-called neoantigens, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well in my, in my talk later on. So uh, I expect that there is uh, lots of uh, uh, people that are very uh, aware of the mass spectrometry-based proteomics workflow. So we start with the sample preparation, extraction of the proteins, enzymatic digestion. And what uh, we usually then do in the proteomics field is to fractionate the peptidome in order to uh, reach deeper into the proteome uh, and give the mass spectrometers time to analyze the complex protein soup that we generate. Uh, now we have been uh, also doing that and developing uh, actually an uh, um, peptide isolated focusing based uh, fractionation uh, already in the past 15 years. And uh, I'm just mentioning it here because I will get back to it uh, later on during my talk. So uh, what the peptide isolated focusing is good for is that it actually fractionates the peptidome very reproducibility uh, into a pattern that uh, looks something like a um, something like this, uh, and it's always giving the same pattern. But the, the reason why it uh, helps in the mass spectrometry-based uh, analysis is that this reproducible pattern uh, actually divides the peptides into discrete fractions. And each of these fractions, uh, or each peptide is usually found in only one or two fractions. 
So we use the mass spectrometer. to couple sequence information uh, from the genome to the protein, we need high peptide coverage of the proteins. So that's why, uh, why we use this method in the proteogenomic setting. So with that introduction, I'll go into a, a example of what we can do in the proteogenomics works. And this is a, a breast cancer study that we did in collaboration with Annalisa Burris and Dale's lab and, uh, in Oslo and in uh, Gordon Mill's lab at uh, MD Anderson. And uh, those of you that have been working with the breast cancer knows that uh, the breast cancer can be divided in uh, so-called intrinsic subtypes based on the transcriptome profile. And uh, this was a seminal work that was actually uh, done partly by Annalisa Burris and Dale and she contacted us and asked if we would like to do a proton view of the intrinsic subtypes. And she still had the, the samples in the fridge, so we could not say, uh, or freezer, we could not say no to that. So what we did is that we, together with Annalisa, piled up a, a, a small cohort of 45 tumors, of uh, breast cancer tumors. Uh, including each of the intrinsic subtypes of the, based on the transcriptomics profile. So the estrogen receptor uh, driven uh, luminal subtypes, tyrosine kinase, HER2 driven HER2 subtype, and then the triple negative or basal subtype that don't have these obvious drivers. And then an uh, elusive normal uh, uh, like subtype that the transcriptomics profiles resembles the normal breast tissue. And with the in-depth proteomics method, we uh, did quantitative proteome analysis uh, of, the, of the breast cancer proteome, uh, covering about 14,000 proteins and uh, 10,000 proteins across the cohort. And then we piled up the other data that was already generated on these 45 tumors, the transcriptomics data, uh, copy number alteration data, uh, some phosphoproteomics, uh, affinity-based proteomics data with the uh, protein uh, arrays, metabolomics data, and, uh, and so on. And then we also used uh, some of this data for the proteogenomics analysis. So I'll, I'll show a few examples from both sides of this and then uh, talk a little bit more about the quantitative proteomics and the proteogenomics extension of this work. So here you see the hallmark uh, proteins that are traditionally analyzed in the immunohistochemical laboratories in all the hospitals with the breast cancer uh, diagnosis. So here is the HER2, uh, and you can see that the HER2 subtype has a high level. And this is usually measured by immunohistochemistry or uh, copy number measurements. And here the data is generated by the mass spectrometry data. You can see the uh, estrogen receptor high in the luminal uh, subtypes as expected and so on. But apart from these few proteins, we then have a landscape of, uh, of uh, all the 14,000 proteins. And this is how it looks like in a, uh, in a general view. Uh, the entire proteome actually uh, divides the breast cancer into a quite similar classification than the transcriptome. But we can actually see interesting uh, subclasses and, uh, and discrepancies also. And using this big proteome landscape, we can start looking at the protein correlation, uh, quantitative correlation across the 45 tumors and start mapping the drug target proteins into this landscape. And in the last panel, I show the phosphoproteomics uh, data and how the quantitative proteome correlates to the phosphoproteome and how these uh, um, how the phosphoproteome and quantitative proteome reflects the proteome subtypes. And uh, I was talking about the importance of having more peptides per gene in order to uh, actually look at the protein variants. But it's also important for quantitative accuracy. So in this data set, we have about uh, 12 uh, unique peptides per gene in average. 
And I get a little bit back to that, what it come, means in the quantitative terms, the number of uh, unique peptides and PSMs. Uh, but if we start looking at the, the proteogenomics or multiomics studies, uh, you can start seeing uh, discrepancies between the transcriptome and proteome. Since we had the transcriptome data and the proteome data in the same cohort, we could look at the correlation of the transcripts uh, to the proteins and how well the transcript level actually predicts the protein level. And here you can see uh, a map of hallmark uh, breast cancer genes uh, marked uh, in, as a red dot. And you can see that the correlation between the mRNA protein level varies a lot. Uh, some of the mRNAs, uh, like the estrogen receptor, uh, can be very well uh, predicted. Uh, the protein level can be very well predicted by mRNA level, whereas others uh, can only be accurately quantified by protein level. And when we started to look at this in detail, uh, we could see that uh, that there is groups of proteins that are very tightly correlating. So this is the protein correlation network, and you can find a uh, hotspots here with uh, proteins that correlate uh, very tightly. So we started to look at these hotspots and um, try to understand what is going on here. Uh, here is some examples of this. Uh, here is group of proteins, and this is the quantitative profile across the 45 tumors. And here is the same uh, on the transcriptomics level. And what we noticed is that often these uh, uh, hotspots of uh, correlating proteins are actually protein complexes. So we tested that by uh, in a genome-wide matter by uh, extracting uh, the known protein complex pairs and compared the correlation between those to the random pairs. Uh, and did that on the protein level and the transcriptomics level. And I hope you can appreciate that actually the correlation on the protein level is much higher than transcriptomics level. So what this tells us is that the proteins that work together and form these interaction pairs uh, are then conserved quantitatively. Uh, and this conservation in uh, or this uh, correlative uh, uh, forming of the complexes is much stronger uh, viewed on the protein level than in a transcript level. So uh, we, you can use this data uh, uh, several ways. You can actually uh, add unknown proteins here and see what is the actual proteome context that these proteins uh, are likely to work to start uh, uh, coupling novel components onto the protein complexes. But you can also see uh, what uh, functions are actually upregulated in certain tumors. Uh, so here, for example, uh, you can see um, that um, uh, this function is uh, highly upregulated in this tumor where uh, not uh, apparently active in this tumor. So using this protein correlation network information, uh, uh, in co-regulation information, we form protein complex network. Uh, so this is the breast cancer proteome network that we formed. And then we use the network module uh, detection tools to find actually the modules and the modularity in this network. And this modularity is then used for uh, GO annotations and uh, different type of pathway analysis and uh, used here for the coloring of the uh, functional coloring of the protein network. And then you can use this network uh, in quantitative terms uh, and start looking at the protein groups that we found in the data. So here is the quantitative differences between the uh, different uh, clusters that we found on the protein level. And you can go all the way into an uh, individual tumor and see how does this protein network and quantitative patterns pan out in a one particular tumor. But you can then also start uh, connecting uh, information to this network. And this is, for example, FDA-approved drug targets overlaid onto the uh, quantitative protein network.
So here you can uh, then start looking at, do we have drug targets that are uh, highly expressed in certain tumors and uh, at the uh, same group of tumors to form sort of hypotheses uh, for combination treatments that you could uh, pick out by looking at the quantitative proton data. So uh, here the quantification is quite important. So I'll make a, a, just a brief detour and show uh, an, a tool that we, we developed when we started to actually analyze these uh, clinical proteomics data sets and notice that the, the quantitative data is often quite noisy. So when you start doing a proteomics experiment and you use t-test to find the significant uh, proteins and then you submit your paper and the reviewer says well you need to do FDA correction of your t-test. We are aware of that what happens is that uh, everything significant goes out of the window. Now here we have the proteome data and the transcriptome data on the same data set and you can do the same exercise in the transcriptomics uh, data you can see that the significant uh, detected genes is also very low. But nobody is doing that on the transcriptomics data. Everybody is doing, doing a bit more advanced and using different bioinformatics tools. For example, DSEC2, uh, which uses actually uh, different ways to pan out the significant uh, genes from the, from the noisy transcriptomics data. So we were really frustrated with this type of uh, comments from the reviewers and this issue that we can actually do a uh, studies and everything matches with expected things, but we still don't have our obvious hits as a significant hits. So we started to do what is transcriptomics people doing better than we are doing. So what they actually do is that they use uh, the uh, data uh, bit differently. Uh, so in the transcriptomics field, for example, the uh, read counts uh, is used for estimating the variance and then the variance estimation is used for the significance testing. And that's what done in the DSEC2. So more accurate variance estimation actually increased the statistical power. I mean, this is very basic. So what we actually do did is a very simple uh, uh, algorithm uh, uh, and just use the proteomics data characteristics. We have a very similar situation in the mass spectrometry based proteomics data where the peptide spectral matches uh, actually uh, behaves very similar to the uh, count data in the transcriptomics. So the more uh, peptide spectral spectral matches we have, have, the more accurately we can uh, uh, estimate the changes. So this is a uh, visualization of the replicate data uh, just organized by the number of uh, PSMs. And, uh, I hope you can appreciate that the, uh, you cannot use the same cutoff with uh, uh, one or two PSMs uh, compared to the 10 PSMs. And this is a perturbation experiment where we have treated the cells and you can actually see control versus treated, how much of the uh, things fall out of the significance range. And still with these uh, methods, difficult to pick these significant changes. So what we actually did is that we uh, use this uh, in the uh, method uh, to improve the estimate, uh, to prove the variance estimation and then use that to find the significant hits based on the PSM count. So we call the method for uh, DQMS, uh, mimicking the DSEC uh, MS. So we're actually a very straightforward, simple thing. Uh, and it's actually built on to the Lima, but actually uh, use the mass spectrometry data characteristics. Uh, so you can uh, then compare that uh, to the uh, t-test or lima-based methods that there is several out for the mass spectrometry data as well. And uh, you can actually see that we, uh, we do quite well with this uh, uh, DQMS. So we've compared that into the, uh, the different methods. 
using the different type of uh, spike in uh, data sets and we land uh, very well. Actually, uh, the real big difference uh, compared to many methods is when you start using the real world data that is usually much more noisier than, uh, than the spike in data sets. And we can see a real benefit when we start using it uh, in the clinical proteomics setting. But all this is uh, in a recent paper that is published in MCP. So if you uh, want to use the, the tool, uh, it's simple to use. It's very quick uh, computationally. Uh, so take uh, advantage of that. So we use that now in uh, our own methods and also the core facility. So with that, I go back to the quantitative proteomics. Now we have a better uh, ways to pan out the quantitative differences. And the one of the differences that we thought were quite interesting in this breast cancer network was the triple negative uh, breast cancer uh, samples that we actually divided in two different groups in the proteomics uh, analysis. And here you can see uh, the triple negative breast cancer is actually a very aggressive breast cancer uh, and uh, there is no targeted therapies uh, related. But we could see a, a typical uh, triple negative breast cancer uh, or basal breast cancer group with a, a high expression of the basal uh, nodule genes, high proliferation uh, cluster here. Uh, and then a an, uh, second cluster with a uh, number of tumors with a low proliferation, a very high uh, T cell infiltration actually. So this is interesting because there is a number of uh, studies now that have started to, clinical studies that have started to uh, test immunotherapies for triple negative breast cancer. So we were interested to start looking at what is actually going on here. And by looking at the characteristics of this infiltration, we can actually see that it's T cell driven infiltration. Uh, we can actually go all the way into single molecules and see how is the antigen presenting machinery in there behaving. So that's uh, then panning into uh, the uh, immunoproteomics uh, type of analysis. So, what is actually causing this T cell infiltration? Uh, uh, and uh, immune system to uh, recognize the cancer is the cancer genome aberrations causing aberrant proteins that are by the immune system uh, detected as non-self proteins. So these are called uh, cancer antigens. And these cancer antigens can be uh, divided in several classes. One are the aberrant uh, protein expression of unexpected proteins like uh, embryonal uh, antigens and uh, testis specific cancer antigens. And the other group is completely novel proteins that are caused by genomic aberrations in cancer. And these can be, uh, uh, these are called neoantigens. So we have been using our proto-genomics method uh, to uh, actually do uh, genome annotation by using the proteomics data. So now we can uh, actually harness our uh, genome annotation pipeline in, uh, into the cancer studies. Uh, so a few years back, we uh, uh, published a, a, a method to use uh, DNA, RNA and protein level for de novo annotation of the genomes. And so we have picked up that type of methods to start looking at the, uh, what is happening in the proteome, in the cancer proteome, uh, if you use the proteome data as a starting point. But there is some uh, problems uh, doing that. And uh, one thing is that uh, when we start matching the mass spectrometry based data to the proteome, we use the known uh, canonical proteome and the peptidome uh, for the database searches. But if you then want to unbias do that into the whole genome background, the database becomes huge. So this is where we have been using the, the isolated focusing as a tool uh, that I talked to you uh, in the beginning of my talk. So the isolective focusing fraction is the peptidome based on the peptide isolative uh, point. And that is actually dependent on the sequence. So we can actually uh, then uh, predict 
based on the peptide sequence, where on this uh, landscape the peptide uh, uh, comes uh, from this peptide fractionation. So what we did is that we took all our peptide data that we had and we trained a peptide uh, PI prediction algorithm. First by a bit traditional methods and now we have been using uh, uh, deep learning uh, in order to uh, do that a uh, bit more unbiased. And so with that method, we can actually then uh, take this big, big uh, database and calculate the peptide PI of all these uh, uh, peptides. And then we can do an experimental fractionation. And instead of searching the experimental fraction against the whole gray barrel, we search it for the PI restricted database. Then we can fractionate rationally this database and see if our peptide matches into the gray matter, the dark matter of the proteome. And uh, so what we actually do is that we do the isolated focusing uh, in, in wet lab by extracting the proteins uh, and the peptides, doing the isolated focusing. And then we have uh, the LCMS data set of each fraction. And then we take the uh, genome sequence predict the peptide PI and form this peptide uh, PI predicted uh, restricted database and decoy database and search uh, this. So what we do nowadays is that we actually do uh, genome sequencing of the, um, of the tumor and the uh, germline and we make this sample specific database and then we do this exercise to try to find what is going on in the proteome side of this. So we have uh, tied this into a, a proteogenomics pipeline that is all available for you as well. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight with this pipeline is that there is a different type of event. Uh, what people have been doing to find neoantigens is looking at the mutated proteins. So the known canonical proteins with uh, single point mutations, uh, and you can call that with a single amino acid variant. So we are also feeding these into the database, uh, but we are also looking at the other type of events like retained introns and missed exon intron boundaries and uh, uh, novel coding regions that are caused by the chromosomal aberrations or other events. But if you look at the mutated proteins, uh, we noticed uh, by curating this pipeline that you actually uh, need to do something more than just uh, um, the database search. Uh, since uh, when we were testing this pipeline with the synthetic peptides, we noticed that uh, in the category of uh, single amino acid variants, we still had quite high force discovery rate. So we actually did an additional tool that we call Spectrum AI, uh, Spectrum Annotated Ions. So what that actually does is that it find, goes back to the uh, MSMS data and looks for BYIM series evidence of the actual substitution of the amino acid. So you can actually add an additional layer of the curation. And here you can see the uh, precursor mass error of the curated versus uh, non-curated. All of these are significant hits from the uh, target decoy search. And this is because of the there is enough peptide evidence to give a good match or the PYN series evidence to give a good good match, but you don't actually have evidence of the uh, single amino acid variants. So this is something that you need to keep in mind if you start doing uh, uh, variant based searches. So this is what we do uh, with the breast cancer uh, data, for example, we search canonical data. We have then the variant specific search and unbiased uh, protein search uh, to find any novel coding regions. And uh, when you look at the breast cancer data, you can actually find uh, uh, variants that are uh, mutated proteins, but you can also find lots of uh, things that are very unexpected. 
for example, uh, uh, novel coding regions uh, caused by pseudogenic regions. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that there is uh, non-canonical start sites. You can see translated uh, UTRs, um, uh, retained introns, and so on. And if we can connect this to the uh, actual tumor specific proteome and uh, match that with a genome effect, these can be really strong uh, targets for immunotherapy because they are completely different uh, compared to the uh, compared to the known proteome. Uh, so this is something that we have been starting to do by looking at the germline and somatic DNA and trying to find which of these are actually related to the genome effects. And for example, uh, do we have novel coding regions that are uh, from the highly amplified regions and so on. And here is an example of a uh, novel coding region uh, that we have find, found in uh, uh, breast tumor but not in the normal tissue, and we can actually relate some of these genome uh, events on those. So uh, this is, of course, interesting and very promising, uh, but you, we cannot start uh, using that uh, off the shelf uh, in patients. Uh, so what we have been doing uh, is mining our data in different ways. Uh, this is an example of the uh, single amino acid variant uh, uh, variant proteins where you can actually see where the single amino acid variant actually stratifies the uh, protein into uh, different expression levels. So marrying the uh, genome data with the protein data, you can start uh, looking at how does the mutations or single amino acid variants uh, impact the protein levels or how the genome aberrations actually can change uh, the quantitative protein. And to go further, uh, we have uh, tried this in mouse, uh, and this is uh, together with uh, Vincent Cerullo uh, lab in Helsinki uh, that is doing uh, uh, immunotherapy development, and they have nice mouse models here. So we did our proteogenomics neoantigen discovery using Vin's mouse model, and we could actually uh, find this type of uh, um, uh, find these type of events in the mouse uh, and then uh, immunize the mouse and uh, see if these are recognized by the T cells. And we can actually see that we some of these findings uh, actually promote T cell uh, uh, activation. So what we are doing now is that we are uh, trying to cure mouse by doing uh, neoantigen vaccines. So we are doing the neoantigen analysis uh, and then we vaccinate the mouse uh, by the peptide vaccines uh, and then uh, engraft the tumor uh, and uh, measure if the uh, immunity has an uh, anti-tumor immunity has an effect. And what we could actually see that it has an effect on the tumor size and we could see uh, that these tumors have uh, CD8 positive infiltration of the immune cells into the tumors. We can see that it actually influences uh, the tumor growth. So this is a, a preliminary data. Now we are trying to analyze uh, what are the actual determinants of, uh, of good uh, peptide vaccine candidates. In parallel, we are analyzing more of the clinical material to understand uh, what we can find in the, in the proteome. And just to wrap up my talk, I'll uh, show a few, uh, few slides. One of the interesting things in the immunotherapy field and the uh, revolution has been uh, engineering T cells to recognize the tumor cells and kill them by changing the T cell receptor uh, to the uh, um, antibody recognition part that recognizes the tumor cell. But the big problem in the T cell uh, field is that it's very difficult to generate specificity uh, to the tumor cells. 
so that the T cells don't attack the normal cells, but are specific for the tumor cell populations. So what we have been doing is to, uh, to couple our neoantigen discovery pipeline uh, to understand where these neo potential neoantigens, uh, tumor-specific proteins, are in the cell. Because in order to uh, CAR T cells to recognize, we need to have them on the cell surface. So for that, we have used the subcell barcode method. So this is another project where we uh, study the cellular proteome. Uh, also a very simple method where we take the cellular proteome, uh, do a reproducible fractionation of the cellular proteome into a number of fractions, do TMT labeling of these fra fractions, pull the fractions back, and then each of the protein will get a barcode how much of that protein was uh, in uh, each of the fractions. And this fraction, uh, this barcode can then also be used uh, for this type of uh, correlation network. So in this uh, work, we had uh, 12,000 cellular proteins in five different cell lines. Uh, it's also published, I will show you the uh, um, reference. But using the similar correlation network, you can, uh, you can uh, visualize this data. It's more discrete this time uh, compared to the tumor proteome because we have actually done experiments of fractionation. I'm just showing this picture because uh, we had a competition uh, of science art at the SciLife lab and uh, we actually were among the winners with this uh, picture uh, that my postdoc um, submitted to the competition. This is a subcellular uh, correlation network of the cellular proteome. But if you structure that bit more, uh, we can find the localization of proteins by looking at the barcode uh, here structured in the secretome, uh, mitochondria, uh, and nuclear neighborhood and cytosolic neighborhood. So this is all also available for you in the resource. You can go and look where your favorite proteins are in the cell. Uh, but what we can also do is that we can now start looking at the neoantigen distribution in this type of correlation networks and associate that with the known uh, uh, compartments and see if we have neoantigens that we think could be a membranous and, uh, and uh, end up in a plasma membrane. They could function as a CAR T cell targets. So this is the, the resource uh, of the uh, subcell barcode. Uh, and this is the breast cancer uh, landscape resource. So you can uh, go and mine the data in these two resources. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up my talk and leave some time for questions. There is also a few other resources from that we have been generated uh, recently. Here's the DQMS that I talked about. Uh, that is recently published. Uh, this is the breast cancer landscape resource that I talked about. This is the subcell. We also started to work on the clinical implementation and we have a molecular tumor board support tool that is currently actually using uh, explaining the genomic variants to the clinicians, uh, but we hope to be able to incorporate proteomics in there. And uh, so that's the next step, but it was recently published um, uh, explanation. And with that, uh, of course, I want to thank uh, the my group that has done all the good work and uh, uh, carrying all these uh, uh, projects and also our financiers and uh, you for uh, attention. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll try to stop share. Okay, thank you very much, Jana, for a very nice talk. We've had some uh, some questions being posted on the on the Slack, so I'll uh, I'll pick a few. Um, I'll I'll start with the more biology related ones, and then go into the technical ones afterwards. Uh, give you an easy start, so to speak. Um, the maybe a very interesting one is what is the biology in the cancer cell 
that causes the translation of the novel coding regions. So where do the novel coding regions come from? Yeah, I think this is uh, a excellent question. I think that there is uh, several different uh, um, events that can happen. I mean, we know from the, the transcriptomics and chromosomal organization studies that many times in the cancer you get these uh, chromosomal domains messed up, the TAD uh, structure. So where you actually, uh, uh, where you uh, where you can actually uh, get um, gene regulation mess up. So I think that some of these events where we see uh, pseudogenic proteins and so on uh, started to be produced. I think that can be this uh, TAD structure mess up. Also, I think that the relocation of the, the chromosomes, uh, you can end up in a, um, a uh, under a strong promoter and, and so on. That, so that's one thing that happens. I think that the, the other thing is the mutations in the, the promoter regions and, and the gene regions where you get novel start sites uh, and also enhance region mutations. And the, the third thing that uh, we see is uh, messed up splicing where you have uh, messed up intron exon boundaries and you start building retained introns and so on. Yeah. So that's essentially a combination of, uh, let's say, a kind of loss of function, gain of function, um, and then of course chromosome reshuffling. Yeah. Um, maybe a related question to that, to some extent, is when you look at, or did you look at uh, whether any of these novel coding regions, the, the peptides you found from those regions, whether they correlated with any known proteins expression? So do you, for instance, in the case of a promoter being um, changed or, or being moved around, you would expect a similar expression profile potentially. Do you have yeah. any indication of that? Yeah, it's um, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, and the reason for that is that that uh, we don't have big enough data sets yet to do that. Uh, the events that we find are usually quite confined in very few tumors. I mean, they can be very individual. There is something that are, uh, that are more widely spread, but I mean, many of these strong uh, events are very individual and that sort of restricts us to uh, do this type of correlation analysis. But what we have been doing is that uh, we have teamed up with few uh, biologists that are actually knocking and overexpressing these. Uh, so we'll see if we can get uh, interesting phenotypes and elucidate the function. Yeah. Um, so another question, this is a little bit more technical. So for the quantification approach and uh, the DEC MS uh, that you that you presented, when you have PSMs that may not uh, have uh, quantification data associated. For instance, in an MS1 uh, analysis, it could be that you have an unpaired uh, uh, PSM and that is ignored if you then uh, go forward. So uh, first of all, did you encounter this problem? Maybe uh, your methods do not suffer from this, but if you lose PSMs in this way that you may not be able to take into account in a quantification, would that not introduce any kind of bias in your uh, quantitative analysis? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think that we have used only the PSMs that we have used for the quantitative analysis uh, in uh, predominantly, and I mean it can um, it it could basically uh, create some bias uh, in a sense, but it, it, you you still base on your quantitative analysis based on the PSMs that you have the quantitative data. Uh, uh, I guess it's uh, so. Uh, you you rely on what you have instead and try to pan out the, the significant hits there. I mean, you can use the, the peptide PSM data for securing the, the protein variants and the identification, but the quantitative data, I think uh, uh, you're better off by using the ones that you have the quantitative data and uh, trying to pan out the, the, the reliability of the quantitation based on those. Yeah, and is there any uh, mechanism for looking at um, peptide level variability so that if one protein has multiple peptides and one peptide would be more variable in its measurements than another, is that taken into account at the protein level or do you essentially say for this protein all these peptides are similar? 
No, that's a brilliant question. And, uh, and uh, we had an, uh, uh, previously we did a method that is uh, called Splice Vista, where we actually do that. Uh, and this is, uh, but now we have uh, learned much more and we have much more peptide rich data. So we have actually div uh, just in process of uh, publishing a next generation version of that, that is much uh, much better. I, I think that we are getting better in this uh, in the proteomics field, and uh, thanks to the improved fractionation and the speed of the mass spectrometers, especially the ion mobility instruments that give so much more peptide data. So, um, so. Uh, so our childish first version is uh, going to get a, a more mature uh, version now. But that's an, uh, definitely something. We also uh, started a years ago, 2011 or so, to do this PQ-PQ analysis where we actually uh, um, take away the outlier peptides that don't correlate with uh, the in a gene-centric analysis. Uh, to improve the quantitative accuracy by just uh, denoising. And then we realized that you can actually start looking at the variant specific uh, regulation, and that's the splice vista. And now we are developing it uh, further to actually uh, improve it because the data has been so uh, improved so much. Okay, and then I have uh, I have another one. Um, this is very technical, but you use the uh, isoelectric point prediction to um, to decrease essentially the the, the search space um, for your runs because you know roughly what PI you have. Therefore, you can uh, you can remove several of these uh, of these potential hits and then make it a whole lot more efficient and get your identification rate up again. But you use decoy approach, obviously, um, was on your slides. How do you make the decoy database? Um, do you make a database of decoy sequences and then predict the PI? Or do you first um, have all the PI predicted subsets and then make specific decoy databases for these subsets? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think we have done both. Uh, and uh, now I don't actually remember which one ended up in the I4 pipeline. Uh, you're putting me in bad spot here. I need to uh, look at that and re respond in the Slack channel. But we have, uh, because that was something that we noticed that we need to actually try to mimic the distribute the type of peptides we have in the decoy database in, in sort of uh, in order it to be more accurate. But uh, and we tried uh, several different variants. Uh, yeah, I told you I, I would leave all the nasty technical questions till the end, right? So now the, all of these guys are coming. But uh, yeah, it's, it would be interesting to know. Um, but I'm, I'm sure it can be read in the publication as well. Um, the uh, a, a kind of a, a similar question, if you like, um, is the Spectrum AI approach is fundamentally a kind of localization approach, if I call it correctly, right? So you try to find flanking ions that delineate the mutation site, which is which is a really good idea, actually. Um, but of course, there is another issue. So the first issue is, is that residue really changed? Um, the second issue is that the mass spectrometer sees only mass deltas. So the mass spectrometer does not see a mutation. Yeah, so an, a modified amino acid could look the same as a mutation. So do you have any idea on whether or not that is sufficiently frequently a problem? Is there some way you look at that or handle that? Um, or is the approach that you use of such a kind that you rarely, if ever, run into this? No, I mean, this is uh, something that we actually noticed when we started to curate those and uh, using the synthetic peptides, and we have uh, been looking at that. And there is certain uh, uh, substitutions that seems to be, uh, um, seems to suffer, I mean, uh, for that. Because if we look at what we have been doing is that we have uh, looked at the sequencing data that we have on the um, exon sequencing, where we have done quite deep exon sequencing, and then we compare uh, the the uh, DQ uh, or the IPO curated data sets. And what we notice is that there is few things that are overrepresented. Uh, so I think that's something that is happening there. Uh, uh, and so we've we've actually removed some of the substitutions or flagged them as a uh, a potentially 
errors. Uh, but I mean, you can actually uh, do that quite well by looking at the frequencies. If you do a very deep sequencing and then you do a deep proteomics and you match uh, all the, the, the substitutions that you have, uh, most of them uh, follow very well the expected patterns, but there is few things that freaky things that we cannot really uh, explain. Yes, uh, that sounds reasonable. I, it, it probably has to do with indeed the frequency of certain residues shifting by certain masses and cor correspondingly the, diff the frequency with which certain residues can mutate relatively easily. Right? Yeah. Um, so maybe something else about the, the uh, prediction of the isoelectric point is the way you do it now is you use the prediction to um, reduce the database size a priori and then you do the search. But you could in principle do the opposite. You could do the search against a really big database and then post-process using the isoelectric point as for instance an input to an algorithm like Percolate um, where it would then help weed out good hits from bad hits. So instead of so instead of a priori, use it a posteriori. Have you tried doing that at any point? And any idea on whether that would be beneficial or, or detrimental? Well, to be honest, I think uh, you more qualified to answer that question than I am. <laughs> we, we have not uh, tested that, but uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> It's, it, it's, it's not supposed to work in the way that the speaker asks the chair, actually. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you may have some difficulty with the concept. Here. Actually, in, in, in my book, um, my preference would be to search the whole space, not limited, but then use these predictors. That's the way we've employed it, right? So when we use um, MS2 predictions and retention time predictions and possibly iron mobility predictions to then afterwards weed out which things look good or bad. So we would use that approach. But of course, there are issues with that because you have um, very large search, search spaces to go through, which create algorithmic issues. And it's all well and dandy when you can build your own search engine and use every trick in the uh, in the information science book to uh, to make that fast. If you're relying on traditional search engines, it becomes a whole lot more difficult. So it, the interesting thing is I have no idea what it would do. Um, so my... my uh, my guess is as good as yours in a way. So I see that there's some new questions coming in, so I'll try to squeeze these uh, these in as well. Um, so um, there's a question about uh, whether the uh, subcellular uh, correlation with the cellular proteome, yeah, this is an extremely colorful graph for that. Um, where does the relation between the cellular proteome and the subcellular proteome come from, if I got this correctly? Yeah, so the... the so what we do there is that we do a, a, um, a quite simple fractionation that is uh, related to the subcellular uh, location. So what we do is that we first release the cytosolic uh, protein by uh, digitonin treatment, and then we uh, do downsync to separate the nucleus and the, and the membranous compartments, and then few steps for um, uh, centrifugation, ultra centrifugation, and uh, low speed centrifugation. So that's uh, pretty much mimicking the type of subcellular uh, fractionation method. So they, these fractions are actually enriched by subcellular compartments. But because we use everything uh, and then rely on the quantitative pattern uh, to decipher. Uh, we don't uh, we don't require pure fractions. I mean, it doesn't matter if they are mixed because if you have a uh, if you have a mitochondrial protein that is in two fractions, it still has a very typical uh, uh, quantitative pattern. So that's how we sort of uh, tease out the and the the why we wanted to do it like that is that it's quite difficult to enrich this uh, subcellular. Um, compartments uh, to, to be very pure. And when you change from cell type to cell type, uh, the fractionation always goes out of the window. So we try to do a very sort of uh, easy reproducible fractionation. And then the other thing that we wanted to do is that we wanted to actually study the protein relocalization. And for that, you need to be able to do it before and after treatment in a very reproducible manner. So if you start uh, doing, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, ultra centrifugation based, uh, gradient centrifugation based methods, it's very difficult to get that in a reproducible manner. 
so I think that there is, uh, of course, uh, Catherine uh, Lilly has been doing similar things, and uh, and uh, I think she has a higher resolution than uh, uh, George Borners uh, have a higher resolution in the deciphering the proteins. But uh, it's very difficult to do uh, uh, protein relocalization studies uh, using those methods. So that's actually the connection to the barcode to the cellular localization, if I understood the question correctly. OK, um, so I think our time is up. Uh, there's another really nice question on the on the Slack, but I'll, I'll leave you to, uh, to answer that on the Slack offline. It's essentially, have you uh, considered using your uh, differential approach on DIA? Uh, so anybody who wants to know what Jana thinks about that, go and have a look on the Slack. I'm sure he'll answer it there. Apart from that, we've got the Slack kind of covered, which is good. Um, so thank you once again uh, from my side, Jana, for a wonderful talk and all this amazing work. It's always very impressive and scary to see what you're doing. Um, and uh, I, with that, I'll give the word back to Joe because I'm sure she will have some closing words. Great, thanks, Leonard, and uh, thanks, Jana, for a great talk. Um, yeah, so um, just for everyone who needs a certificate of attendance, this.